Uh, now I'd like to introduce our presenter today, Stephen Endersby. Uh, Steve is the Simulation Product Manager here at uh, Dassault System SolidWorks. He's a passionate believer in the benefits of design analysis. Stephen is also confident that every designer can make use of the SolidWorks simulation tools. Prior to joining the product management team, Stephen was a territory technical manager for five years, covering the UK and Northern European region. With his wide exposure to many industry problems and extensive education, including a PhD in analysis, uh, a master's in aerodynamics, uh, Stephen is well versed in the application of simulation to solve real life problems. Welcome, Stephen, and thank you. It's all yours. Hi, Amy. Um, as Amy was saying, my name is Steve Endersby. I'm a simulation product manager here at SolidWorks. And today I'm going to take you through um, a quick 22-minute um, view of simulation. Now, we can't do everything in 22 minutes, so I'm going to have to do things uh, quite fast. So hopefully um, you'll, uh, you'll get a taste for what SolidWorks can do. Um, so let's crack on. So what I want to do is I want to give you a little bit of background about um, design validation, um, give you a quick demo, how you can use design validation, and then uh, a, a summary. And as Amy said, we've got some time at the end for a quick question and answer. Now during the session, there will be uh, somebody monitoring the question. So if you do have a quick question, type it into the question box, and uh, Jason at the other end will answer you um, if he gets the time. So. Quickly, what is design validation? Um, design validation is basically using um, analysis tools um, to test and validate your design during the design process rather than checking it at the end of the design process. Um, the whole idea behind design validation is that you should um, ask early questions about your product performance and find out the failures very early on. It's going to ask allow you to answer fundamental questions about your product um, when change is easy and cheap at the very beginning. Um, so rather than waiting for the full product to be designed, let's do things as early as possible. And so with that in mind, there's a quick question regarding um, what current design validation methods are used. Um, today are you using physical testing? Do you use hand calculations? Um, do you use an external uh, analysis tool? or do you use a CAD integrated analysis tool, or do you use no uh, validation methods? So if you vote now, as I say, vote early and vote often. So we still have a, a couple more seconds while people are voting, uh, but so far it looks like majority use physical testing or hand calculations. Uh, there's uh, followed by integrated FEA, and a small percentage don't use any uh, FEA or design validation. Okay, so if we look at these results, um, it's neck and neck between the, the top two. I mean, analysis uh, validation isn't a replacement for physical testing, so many people have to do it. What we want to make sure is that you do um, only one physical test as opposed to multiple tests. And it's good to see that the uh, CAD integrated FEA is up there as well. So, so the question is, why do I do design validation? I think one of the um, most useful things about design validation is the early selection of the best design. Now you might have seen a graph something similar to this on the screen, but it basically shows you in a very graphical way that by doing all your what-if scenarios or your problem finding early on in the design stage, the cost of change is very, very cheap compared to doing things during prototyping and production, or heaven forbid, during production. Um, it gives you confidence to innovate. Innovation is itself inherently risky, but it's also very profitable. So if you want to innovate, you really should be sure that the product is going to work before you cut metal, um, as opposed to finding out with multiple prototypes whether the thing is going to work or not. And lastly, design validation allows you to reduce the cost of your product and your product development cycle. So you can reduce prototyping, physical testing, reduce the amount of materials. It has lots of cost benefits. So the next question is all about who would you expect to carry out a design validation? Who would you expect to use these tools? 
Would it be a company specialist, a product designer, an external consultant, or nobody? We'll give everyone just a couple more seconds to fill in their answers. And we've got a, a clear winner here, Stephen. Uh, the product designer, 81% said that they are responsible for carrying out the design validation. Which is exactly the way I feel. The product designer knows how the product should work in the real world, so he is ideally placed to solve these problems. So somebody asked me one time what design validation is, and I just tried to come up with an, an, an analogy um, for what, uh, what design validation is. And the best I can come up with is like cooking in a foreign language. Um, so what do I mean by that? I mean, the whole art of analysis is to accurately describe the real world in the virtual world. And that's really where the foreign language comes in. You have to be able to translate the real world into the virtual world. And what do I mean by cooking? What I mean by cooking is you have to have the right amount of stuff to describe these real world actions uh, to get a correct solution. So you have to have the right amount of each ingredient. Problem is, too much or too little of any ingredient will invalidate your analysis, or it may result in results which take excessively long to solve with little or no benefit. So let's move this um, analogy a little bit further when we think about the ingredients of design validation, essentially we have six steps, six ingredients that we have to um, look at for our analysis. We have to get a good description of the geometry. This describes the problem. It's, it's the, the product and its environment. We have to describe the materials. Now this isn't just about what material, is it aluminium, is it steel, but it tells me how it will behave. Okay, or tell me if it's hot, if it's cold, if it's brittle, if it's ductile. So we need to have a good materials description. We have to be able to describe the interactions of our parts. I mean, what happens when the parts touch? Is heat transfer? Is there friction? Uh, do they stick? Are they bonded? Are they welded? Are they bolted together? How is this interaction managed? Uh, we also have to think about things like loads. And this is telling me what the environment does to the parts, pressures, forces, torques, temperatures. We also have to think about the restraint. Now the restraints are basically letting me know, or I'm telling the system, how the product interacts with or is held by the environment. And lastly we have the result. Essentially the results are telling you about the analysis. And in actual fact, when people think about doing an analysis, they're thinking about the results that they want out of the analysis as a guide to the way of the inputs that they're putting in. So the next question I want to ask you is that when you're doing your design validation or, or physical test, what failure modes are you looking for? Is it strength, flexibility, endurance, resonance and vibration, or temperature with a thermal analysis? Again, we'll give people a few more seconds to put in their answers. Uh, but it looks like strength analysis is the, the number one uh, mode that people are testing for these days. And to be honest, that's not surprising. Um, basically, you want to make sure the, the product will not fail um, under its working load. Um, but the, the other thing is that one has to remember is that 80% uh, of metal failures is not due to the strength of the product due to its endurance. So fatigue life, endurance testing uh, is always a factor. So enough about talking about um, design validation. Let's have a look at a, a little demo about it. So what I want to do is uh, I want to have a look at a simple little problem. Um, let's consider that I'm, I'm a design engineer who makes manufacturing fixtures. And I've got to get a new clamping system because my uh, manufacturing parts have changed and my old clamp is now causing a big interference. And I need to look to 
check for strength, but also not just strength, to look for the endurance to make sure the product will last long enough. So let's move on. I'm sorry about that, I seem to... That's the speaker. Okay, I'm sorry about that, we seem to have a little bit of a, a mess up with the audio. Um, so, as I was saying, hopefully you heard me, but maybe you didn't. What I need to do now is describe the, um, the problem in terms of geometry. How much geometry do I need to include? Um, I need to include as much geometry that will actually affect the, the, the clamp arm itself so I can uh, suppress all the other parts or, and get rid of them. And now I can start building my analysis. So I can quickly create a, a new study. And when we look at this study, we have our geometry. Next step is the materials. Now the materials have already been assigned, assigned inside of SolidWorks. So that's come across uh, nicely. Next thing we have to start thinking about is the interactions. How do these parts move together? Um, and this can be done by, um, by the, the contact between them. So let's think about how they might um, touch each other. So we can create um, a contact between one part and another part and say sometime as the load comes on, these two parts might hit each other. But another way the interaction might happen is that you can see here that there are some pins missing. Okay. I could actually model those pins, uh, but a lot quicker is to actually create a virtual pin. It's very simple. And this has the advantage that I now can do an analysis and I don't have to have all the geometry at hand before I can do this analysis. That allows me to ask these questions early on in the design process. So I can keep on going through here and adding these pins in. But we are short for time, so I don't have time to put all this in. So let's jump away from that. So we've done an interaction through contact, an interaction using a, a virtual pin, which can do bolts and springs and such like. The next thing to think about as we go down this list is we want to apply the fixtures. We want to tell the geometry, how it's held. Um, we can do some a quick fixture here. Because this part is bolted down to a very strong piece of material. So that's fixed in place. And the clamp will come down and press on uh, the actual uh, manufactured item. So that can <coughs> roll and slide on that face there. So now the part's fixed in, fixed in place. It has its materials, we know how it's interacting. Lastly, we need to apply our load. Now if you remember in the uh, initial geometry view, we had this piston, and the piston would interact with these two bolt holes here. Okay, so we're going to apply a force onto there, and we're going to direct that the distance and say let's apply 80 newtons of force. Okay. So now I'm going to push on that and that's going to close this clamp down. Again, purely for time, I won't run this live. It only takes a couple of minutes, but when you only have 22 minutes to do this, that's a, a couple of minutes too long. So if we jump across to uh, a model I prepared earlier, we have the same 
all our pins, we have our contacts, we have our fixtures. And now after you get the result, we can see the maximum stress. And you can see here, as these parts come down, we end up with some peak stresses in these sharp regions here. So we have some regions of blue and some regions of red. The question then is, well, is red bad? How, how do I know that this is, you know, is, is this too much or, or, or not enough? And what we have is we have a factor of safety plot. <coughs> and what this factor of safety plot does is it takes the local stress, compares it to the material's yield strength to see if it's greater than the yield strength or not. So we want to make sure that the stress is always less than the yield strength by a factor of one or two or three. Now you'd never have it as one because that means we're right on the limit, it's about to fail. Typically you'd have it at a minimum of two, preferably three or four. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a factor of safety plot. And it's telling me already that my factor of safety is quite low. It's 1.7. Here. Okay. Because I have a very high factor of safety with some parts, let's, let's alter this so I can see what's going on. And I said I really wanted a factor of safety of 3, for example. Okay. So it's telling me actually the vast majority of what I want to look at is very, very safe. Again, it's where those high stresses are is my area of concern. So we now can see that the part is maybe slightly overstressed in a few regions, but they're not that big. Can I get away with it? Other things to look out is to, to look and see, well, how much is this part moving? Um, and it's moving, if I just change this uh, to a floating point, so we can all see it's moving about half a millimeter, which isn't a great deal of movement. So it's fairly stiff, it's, uh, it's not very flexible. The other thing that when we talked about failure modes, we talked about strength, we talked about flexibility, the other thing we talked about was endurance. How many times can this clamp come down and uh, still survive? And this is done by a fatigue test. So let's create a, a quick fatigue test. And basically here, what we're going to do is we are going to apply one million of those action forces. Okay, so we're going to say one million. And it's going to go from zero load to full load. And that's the great thing about um, sort of simulation is that once you've done one analysis, the actual secondary analysis are very simple. Okay, again, I could hit run, but again, it would take me another couple of minutes to solve, which I don't have. So let's have a look at a set of results I looked at earlier. And we want to know, well, how long will any of these parts last for? Okay. This is showing that anything that's red is going to last more than a million cycles. Okay, but we have some regions where it says, you are going to get a crack in that region at around about 260,000 cycles. And here we are. Again, it's where we'd expect it to be. But what's interesting here is that if it's going to fail after maybe 2 million cycles or 10 million cycles, that crack is going to grow across that region there or across here. So again, this is telling me as a designer I need to take out that shock. And it could be as simple as running a fillet down that edge or maybe you just thicken the material up a little bit. But now, as a designer, I've asked this question early, so I can decide whether I want to go back, put a fillet in, do I want to make a different material, do I want to make it slightly thicker, or maybe start again from scratch. Before I spent days or weeks designing this product, I have seen the problem, and I can rectify it before any metal has been cut. I think uh, Amy has a couple.